podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third Degree, the podcast is brought to you by Soccer90.com. You know, this is where I usually tell you that they got all the FC Dallas, North Texas, and U.S. Men's National Team gear you can want. But this week, man, you got to check out the brand new Soccer 90 item of the week. That's the Dallas Tornado jersey, which is so awesome. White base with the blue trim, the 67 on the front. I bought myself one. It's fantastic. The jersey is part of the Dallas Tornado limited collection there at Soccer 90. You can use the code third degree and 20% off at checkout. Some exclusions apply, but you can definitely use that code on that Tornado jersey. You get yourself one. They're hot. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to episode number 205, 205 of Third Degree, the podcast. Hello, it is me, Peter. Hanging out first with my good bearded friend, Dan Crook. Howdy, Dan. Hello, it is me, Dan. Mm, you do that better than I do. And your hero, my hero, everybody's hero, superhero of the Dallas Cup, Buzz Carrick. Come in, Buzz. Hi, Peter. I'm enjoying one of my favorite weeks of the whole year, Dallas Cup week. You didn't. You didn't do the voice. Um, what? I, I didn't oh, yeah. I, I, just th- I just thought that's how the podcast yeah, was we're going all, this week. We're all doing a voice today, Buzz. Come on. That sounds weirdly like Marvin the Martian. I or literally have a cup Kermit. of tea here with my pinky oh. sticking out. Does that count? No. Can you at least try to say hello no. back in a funny voice? No. Come on, Boo. Buzz. <laughs> Come on, Buzz. <laughs> my voice is funny enough as it is. I don't need No, any. just do a little funny voice or something. No. That's like a man in a a tiny man in a box. It is like a tiny man (laughs) in a box. (laughs) All right, we're going to get into uh, Dallas Cup stuff here a little bit later in the pod because there is much to talk about, including the annual Dallas Cup uh, kerfuffle. (laughs) Yeah. This one was rather amazing. Uh, And we will explain how a player gets three yellow cards in a game. We will uh, get to that here in a little bit. But first, let's talk about... Uh, our little old burn won, Timbers won, and the only thing that I have to say about this game, Buzz, is I was as I was watching it throughout the entirety of, well, I would say through the through the vast majority of the game, the one driving thing that was running through my head is, man, this is going to get boring. Repeating this week after week, the low block is this team's kryptonite. Yeah. Yeah, well, at least Portland tried to do it like as a mid block. So Dallas, as a result, played more balls over the top and a high, had a higher percentage of connections than normal. Uh, but still, you're right. It's like, other than the very few teams at the top of this league who think they can play and want to play, like everyone else basically is going to, especially when they come into Dallas, they're going to block. You're just going to have to get used to this idea. Because it's gotten more and more teams have done it every time, and, and it's difficult to do. It's difficult for anybody to do, but Dallas in particular struggles with it because of the way they want to play. And I will add to the fact that because Portland doesn't want to have the ball at all, they want you to have it. Their their possession. <laughs> Here, take it. <laughs> yeah, literally, they're like for the bulk of their game. I, mean, I looked at like the 70th minute, and their possession was under 40 percent. By the end of the game, it had come up to 41 ish, uh, just slightly under 41 percent. The problem is for Dallas is that Dallas's best ability when they're at their best is when they're playing rapid transition off of a turnover or a recovery and they can quickly get at you before you're set. That's what they like to do the best. Sometimes it comes from a press, but more often than not, it's just because of their midfield tenacity. If you can't do that when the other team only has 40% possession. So for what you're good at is even harder. It's not even just the block. It's like they also were stuck trying to pass the ball around like Lucci ball. So uh, yeah, not it's not good, and uh, Dallas is going to have to keep working on ways to try and be better at this, and I think that's why um, you know they can keep trying different formations and stuff, partially to try and fix this. Dan, do you have any uh, any particular thoughts or overriding thoughts about uh, the draw? Well, that was a gut punch, wasn't it? That, uh, that injury time uh, equalizer. The, but you uh, could kind of you, but it was pretty clear it was coming, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh no! Absolutely. Um, the 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 lot of changes, changing the shape, really twice. Um, just yeah, it, it it was coming. They invited the pressure. Couple of switch offs in the midfield. Doesn't no one follows a runner, and and there it is. Um, just, I mean, there's there's that little bit of embarrassment that guy making his uh, his MLS debut gets to score 
after seven minutes with probably his third or fourth touch maybe uh the the atmosphere in the locker room was was dead um you know it it was like I mean, it was it was it was like a it was worse than a defeat almost because, <laughs> you know that that Portland team was there for the taking um, and yeah it was that was that was awful. So uh, Buzz, oh I'm sorry, what were you going to say, Dan? I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, that, that was really it. Um, Jesus was kind of an interesting one. He, uh, you know, we saw his body language kind of drop through the game. He was reduced to kind of just walking around looking miserable by the end of it. Uh, they they kind of dragged him up for for media stuff and and uh, that was someone that absolutely did not want to be in the room that they were in uh, at that moment in time. So you know um, he talked a lot about how it's all about how they react. Yeah, that's probably the uh, PR training with the US national team that's paying off there. But um, you know hopefully that is it. One thing uh, that did come to mind though while I was there. You're always very keen on attendance watch. We're now three or four sellouts. Yeah. Um, why would you make the red out game, the game that's notorious for teams wearing their own jerseys while attending Dallas Cup, the red out game? I don't understand. What do you mean? Well, the whole point was, oh, yeah, we want everyone to wear red, the staff wearing red. Nico did his press conference in a in a red jacket. Yeah. But the the game immediately before uh, the, of the starting weekend of Dallas Cup is the game where tons of teams in Dallas Cup attend. Oh, or in town, and they're all their, wearing oh, their oh, own oh. gear. Yeah, interesting. So, like looking out on over the east side from the press box, you know, you could see the blobs of green and blue and white and orange. You know, all these teams that are gathered around. It's like why? What? You know, it it was like <laughs> doing the. Dallas Stars green thing for the Austin game it just didn't really make a whole lot of sense why you would it was a weird choice and I did note that <laughs> I did laugh quite a bit when I saw the uh, a social media guy was kind of giving the players the business when they all showed up for their fit pictures I think they call them fit pics mm -hmm. before the game none of them wearing red and he had a comment of like thanks for showing up for red out day guys <laughs> Well, at least they were red on the field. Yeah. Yes, at least they they they, they yes they did. Uh, all right. Well, uh, yeah, Dan, I have no idea. I, I don't think they probably thought that one is well is through through as well as they should have. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Uh, Buzz, I, one of the things that I was thinking about is when you when you get a result like that. <clears throat> And Dan's comment of the players all being bummed out and feeling like it's worse than a loss, in some ways, it is kind of worse than a loss because they, there is no excuse for not winning that game. And, and at the same time, it never really ever felt like there was, like it always felt like it was going to end up that way. And I think that's a reflection of how the team is playing at this yeah. particular moment in time in the season. Well, it'll depend on how they react. Um, it's going to be, you know, it, it, if they can't galvanize from it and be like angry from it and, and try and take some of that uh, emotion and turn it into uh, a positive force in their game, then, you know, whether it be in training or whether it be the next game, then yeah, it's going to be worse than a loss. Um, you know, Dallas had a good uh, volume of shots. And honestly, Portland's keeper had like five saves, which is a really good performance. So if he hadn't been on his game, I think the thing would have been over. But, you know, that's why you play it. You got to play the game. And he had a good game. And so it wasn't easy. And and the team's getting increasingly frustrated. And the biggest sign of that, as Dan mentioned, is that Jesus drifts more and more and more. And, um, you know, they're going to have to take this, hopefully, and not point fingers and not blame each other. Because that's when your teams start to fall apart. If they continue to leak a goal a game and they continue to not score at the rate they were scoring last year, and, and by all these advanced metrics that you like to talk about, their XGs are there on both for and against that are still like they were last year or better, but yet the results aren't there. So, you know, again, that's some of the fallacies sometimes with the XG stuff. You know, you can analyze, as Oscar used to say, you, you have to analyze how well you're playing without the goals, but in the end, the goals are what matters, man. You know, if you, you can play really well, but whatever measure you want to have, but if you don't get it in and win, win the game, then you don't win the game. And so that's what it matters. 
And they're going to have to figure out how to do that, or it's going to be a long year. So I think this is the appropriate time to have a conversation uh, because this is, I think we were all relieved to see Sebastian Legette return into the starting lineup after the whole Becky G kerfuffle and whether or not how long it was going to take for him to recover from that. Um, But I don't think he particularly played very well. And I'm not sure that any of us feel like he's played particularly well or up to expectations at all this season. Maybe we understand why. But I also feel like we also, I also feel like we need to have a conversation about Areola's performances to date. He's, uh, uh, Dan, do you have any, uh, do you want to start with that, the conversation on those two? No, not really. (laughs) (laughs) Why not? Why do you sound so worried? Uh, I have no major uh, insight as as to why, honestly. Okay, Buzz. Yeah. Um. In this particular game. Wait. Hold on. Hold on, Buzz. Wait a second. Yeah. Dan, do you agree that neither one of them are playing well? Who was the first one? Sorry. I said I, sub- Legette and Areola. I actually didn't think Legette was horrible in the last game. I thought he was pretty. He tried. He definitely moved himself about. Tried to get involved in play, despite the block. Um, you know, he he was trying to get on the end uh, of passes. He had a couple of shots off target. You know that. Considering we've we've been kind of bemoaning how quiet he's been, I was happy to at least see that, especially as a reaction after you know the stuff he's going through uh, right now. Um, on the other hand, Ariola uh, was, you know, aside from what the shot that was saved, pushed out wide, then ultimately led to the goal, was yeah, he's he's been just far too quiet so far this season. Okay, thank you, uh, Buzz. Now you yeah. go. Uh, I thought legit. Um, Legit clearly to me was trying to get around the block. This is one of the things you do is trying to go wide. I just thought he overdid it a little bit. Like his pass chart is all within like 10 yards of the sideline or 90% of it is, uh, which to me squeezed down Giovanni too much. Uh, Now, granted, um, those guys in in Areola too, I think were playing some really nice little one touch kind of combos and moving forward. They actually were able to get through the midfield a little bit, very wide. The problem was when they got to the front line, particularly in the first half, Areola kept killing it like that. Like there was, there was multiple plays that died at his feet. Um, he is not in the form. He was basically a year ago at this time when he was the MLS player of the month. Um, when he was in that peak form of his, uh, the, the, uh, this about the time last year. So I think by any measure, he would tell you that he's not going right well right now. Now, why that is, is hard to say. I mean, I'm not super dialed in with Paul and how he's feeling about things. Like, is he carrying a knock we don't know about? I don't know. You know, is this all World Cup non-selection hangover? He kind of seemed like to me a guy who was galvanizing that. Um, maybe it's just the, the just the disconnect in the front line in general. I mean, I think the whole front line is not quite clicking like it was last year. You know, I can't put my finger on exactly why that's the case other than just like stuff's not going in, which is weird that that's the case, you know, because this team all last year was was pretty good at finishing like they're they're They finished above their, um, you know, percentage rates and their XGs and all that stuff. And the finishing was all pretty clinical. You know, it's, they've always been a low shot, high, um, not always this last year. They were a low shot, high conversion team. So it, it might just be, you know, um, general funk. When the, when the defense is giving up a goal a game, you might just feel like you're having to work twice as hard. Maybe that's not a good place to be. I, I think that there's multiple guys on this team that maybe didn't have the winner they were expecting. And so I'm hoping some of it's just kind of hangover and that we'll come out of it here eventually. Well, wait, hold on. I want to dig into that. When you say winter, they were expecting. What do you yeah. mean by that? Are you talking about like Jesus well, in the Jesus, World Cup? Yeah, Jesus in the World Cup. You know, Paul not getting to the World Cup. I would imagine that despite that most of us thinking Legette was fairly out of the picture, he probably was holding out hope that he was going to be in there. You know, Paxson probably wasn't in that picture, but he probably is thinking to himself, the way I've been playing, how come I'm not getting some of these, you know, extra side kind of camp stuff look yet? You know, Velasco probably had a really good winner in the sense that Argentina won the whole thing. But, 
you know, he's not getting these call ups either. So he might be getting to wonder whether he's in the right place too. So um, I don't really, I, I have not been able to put my finger exactly on what's going on with this team offensively. Cause it looks like it's functioning the same just without the goals. So I, I, it's a it's kind of a mystery, and I don't have much of an answer for it. All right. Um, now you mentioned uh, about the lack of clean sheets, and I think the the common stat that's been thrown about is they were like on a run of twelve. It's games? twelve. It's the longest streak in MLS. Twelve games without with, with one plus goals allowed, which runs back into last season. Yeah, including playoffs. Yeah. All right. So take the take the the uh, uh, added time goal for Portland away. Do you feel like Dallas played well defensively up until that point? Yeah, that's the weird thing. Is I talked to Coach about that today, and he's like, and he said that they actually feel like they're playing pretty good defense, and a lot of these goals that they're getting are, to quote him, shit goals. <laughs> you know, and, and I it's love like, that. Uh, you know, there's an own goal here. There's that thing from the touchline uh, from the baseline against Iriaga and Paz the other day. You know, I I think like he feel he feels like my my takeaway from that conversation was that he feels like again that they're playing well. They're just not getting the breaks. The, the balls aren't bouncing their way. And it all starts to add up after a time. But that's part of the thing. Again, that's the thing, right? Like, I, I grant you that you may not feel like they're playing bad and they're only one goal a game's not that bad. But at some point, you got to get some clean sheets. You got to win some of these one nothing games. Yeah. Usually at home, you know, you got to get some shutouts. Like the other day, Paws had a bad game, you know? So it's like just little things here and there. And I, and I don't think you can undersell. Look, we said flat out that we understood why they didn't bring Matt Hedges back or why they didn't pick up that number. That number was nuts. And then they wanted to bring him back, but they couldn't get a deal done. We get it, right? We knew there were going to be some pains from that. And it may be that that's all this is defensively, is some pains as they're trying to figure out what their best combos are and who their next their pieces are. And, but, you know, at some point, you got to think to yourself, man, we got to get a clean sheet here and there. You know, you can win every game if you want, 3-1 to one or 2-1, to one, but that's hard work. You know, that allowing a goal a game, puts more pressure on your offense that man we got to get at least one we got to get two now to win every time instead of one to win so it's all part of the package yeah i i you know the moment uh, that particular sequence was several guys all switching off at the wrong time jimenez doesn't press uh chara hard enough chara gets to make the pass out wide farfan falls asleep uh that guy gets in behind him and uh you know i don't know how much paxton's at fault here but paxton clearly allows that guy to get in behind him before he realizes for that half second that he needs to be on him. And by the time he gets back, the shot's in. And well, if Agunda is not tracking anybody, he's just strolling. Right, rather, yeah. Or, for, or dropping into the zone or whatever. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's it, multifaceted. Yeah, and yeah. so a lot of this uh, giving up of goals has been switching off or in the case of last week, pause just having a couple of really – Really bad brain farts. Yeah. You know, but his supermodel girlfriend was coming back to town. So let's give him some. Yeah. Well, you know, this year the coach has been preaching that mentality talk, right? So, like, for me, this was the thing I didn't like about the late sub for Martinez that put them into the 5 4 1. Because in my brain, that that says to the team, pack it in and, and try and block right. it off and try and kill the game out. And I, I asked coach about if he had any regrets about that or second thoughts about that sub. And he was like, well, no, because if, if we just stay in the same formation and they just scored them, people would have been like, well, why didn't you bring in the extra center back? And he's right. It's a lose-lose proposition. But I, I, don't, I just didn't like that last ditch, like, because that tells your whole team, lock it down, mail, you know, we're, we're going to block this out. We're not going to go for it. We're just going to sit here and try and block. And it puts you into a reactive mental state rather than a proactive mental state. That can be true defensively, too, as well as offensively. And I never want a defensive mental state. And I think that – so, you know, Coach didn't agree with, with, the, with that because of that argument that it's going to go either way. And he, he liked the idea of having a little more height in there for balls in and that kind of stuff. But Yeah. You know, it's funny, Buzz. It's been so many days since the game happened. I don't recall I, – I remember being frustrated by the substitute of a third center back in as well because I didn't feel like Portland – was had done anything to deserve yeah. Dallas to need to throw in a, a third center back because my other observation was is I really enjoyed the change when he put Jimenez on and switched the team to more of a, a four two three one formation and suddenly things look like they started to click and they seem to have some success now they didn't turn into any goals but I, there was a period of time there where I was kind of enjoying watching this, this version of uh, of the burn versus what we've been, yeah. what we had been getting. Yeah, I, I, at the time I was thinking, I can't remember exactly who was still in the game, but I kept thinking maybe like, do I have another 
super, super active, energetic, high pressure I could bring in, even if it's like out of position. Like at that time, like Siki and Kamigo were still on the bench. Like, could I have pulled Areola and put on one of those guys to just t- harass the tar out of Portland up high and make it really difficult? That maybe that kind of vibe, like it's not exactly a sub late that bothered me. It was the idea that like the extra center back five at the back. I'm look again. I'm big on this reactive mindset defending kind of thing. Like I don't want to give up what I've been doing. This working kind of vibe. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. That's where I when it happened. I was like, okay, and then it didn't work. So you know. Yeah, he puts uh, he puts Jimenez on for Legit, and the game changed. I I thought the team looked a little bit more dangerous. Uh, no, that was a good that, sub. That was yeah, good. Yeah. That, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, that's yeah. kind of, that's why I wanted to push that. That's why I thought the the insertion of Martinez was self defeating, um, because I thought they had something clicking, and I didn't think Portland was being so dangerous that suddenly they needed to go. They needed to pack it in. Well, there's something we've always said about um, Jesus is that he's better as that second striker, and Jimenez is really good at movement that occupies center backs and it stresses them and pulls them slightly out of position. And from the minute he came on, Jesus all of a sudden was finding all kinds of stuff. And that's what I think that really works. And that's something we'll come back to that later. I think in the podcast, you know, and I'm sure Dan, you probably feel the same way about that. Where where, did you a like the Jimenez move? And then do you feel the same way I did about this defensive late game mindset problem? Yeah. I love that. I thought um, that move in tandem with, uh, Faku coming on for Surio. Surio, just to kind of have Faku sit a little bit deeper than Surio was. So you know, Surio, you he's know, is, is definitely too at that point. Well, that too, yeah. yeah. But you know, he's more that progressive. He's going to carry the ball. He's going to, you know, uh, just have more of a safe bet, protect the ball option in Faku, and then kind of. You know that allows you to open up that midfield space. Have Jesus drop in behind. Oh, sorry, Jesus Ferrer drop in behind Jesus Jimenez. You guaranteed to have someone lead in the line then, which was was proven to be an issue. It, you know, uh, the fact that um, the fact that Portland made several subs immediately after in two spells. You know, you could see that Savarese was was trying so hard to kind of figure out how to play against that well uh and just to remind everybody the goal finally came after the uh, initial change up with Jimenez in for Leggett and and Faku on for Cerillo it came in in the 74th minute um so I, I just I the reason why I bring all that up Buzz is is it possible that maybe part of the solution to Dallas's mid to low block kryptonite woes is a change in formation that allows yeah. them to put allows them to maybe pull Jesus back a little bit and maybe put him into what I think you've thought for a very long time is a better position on the field for him. Oh, it's absolutely an option. It's one of the things they looked at today in fact. Um in this particular game, they had a whole lot of success on set plays. Um, I think Jesus Ferreira had a ridiculous number of uh, key passes, which is like a shot creating pass, something like five or six of them, which is unbelievable performance. Well, five of them were off of corners. Just to underscore how dangerous they were, you know, I think having Ibiaga provide a second corner threat to Tafare is actually really helping those corners and set plays this year at least be dangerous, if not actually get goals. So that's obviously part of, if you're trying to break down a block, um, as we talked about with Jimenez coming in there, his movement better pulls defenses out of stress. Uh, or what well, I shouldn't say that because Jesus does that too. But with Jesus is under him, Jesus can better take advantage of those stresses because when you're doing it by yourself as a false nine, you have to do it yourself. You create the stress and you go back. Well, this way he plays off of Jimenez and it really works. Facundo under him is probably an adaptation to the fact that he's going to be, that space is going to be bigger and you want maybe as Dan said, that more stable guy underneath there. So that look that whether you want to call it a four, four, two or a four, two, three, one, they are different. And the difference mainly has to do with where your wings end up playing and how deep that Jesus ends up playing. Um, so there, there, or there is a difference there, and we'll try and recognize when the, what the differences are when we get to any given game that you see it. But it's definitely in the cards, and they also have in their deck that three four three that they used earlier. 
um, in the year. And, and you saw the four, two, three, one specifically at LA FC that they used that I believe it was, uh, we saw that. And, and there, there's even a version of three, five, two version, which would be really weird. I don't know how that would work per se, but they could do that. You know, and if you have Legette and Areola who maybe aren't playing gangbusters, then maybe one of those guys is going to be sacrificed to play this way in the short term, or at least in certain situations. So it's very plausible. I saw a, a tweet. I think it was from the Portland uh, Twitter account that described their one-one draw in Dallas as well deserved. Did you? Would you agree with that, or is that just biased? Well, it depends on what your, what your game plan was. I mean, if your game plan was to mid block and destroy the game for 90 minutes and then go for it and try and steal a point, then I suppose you could say you deserved it. Um, you, you executed your plan. I mean, that's depends on whether you think a, a point is deserved for playing beautiful, sexy soccer or for grinding out a specific game plan to get a result. So mm. I, I wouldn't say they deserved a point. I would have said Dallas deserved a win, but I also acknowledge that I'm probably biased <laughs> at <I> mean, the <laughs> least. <laughs> you definitely say Dallas dropped two points, but yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, to have the number of injuries they have go the whole month of March without a win, uh, you know, come in against a, a semi-decent team, uh, get battered around for, 70 minutes and walk out with a point. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's a great moral victory, if nothing else. I'm going to say they earned a point rather than they deserved a point. Because okay. they worked their tails off. I admit that. Well, I certainly uh, I will put a pin and post this on the wall as one to remember at the end of the season if yep. Dallas comes up short or ends up in a bad matchup in a playoff because they were one or two points off uh, lost. This is one to remember because they absolutely should have won this game and, frankly, should have scored uh, several goals. Uh, and it's, I'm certain it's the, the finishing thing, Buzz. You Always know. remember that uh, draw with Real Salt Lake in 2017 that ultimately, several months later, was what cost FC Dallas the playoffs that year. That's right. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, all right, let's yeah. talk about something that I thought was uh, a really interesting thing to see because we've all talked about this for a while because of his suspension for the crummy red card. Giovanni Jesus, G uh, Giovanni Jesus, Jesus got his yeah. start, and we got to see a whole lot of him in this game, and I think there's something in there that we could be interested mm. in, Buzzard. Yeah, he was great. Uh, and I came in worried about a very specific thing in training – when they're working on a build out and he's under pressure, he will make a no look pass right into the middle of like where he's expecting the six to be. And if the six isn't there ready, it's horrible. And he does, he will do that two or three times a training session. And so I was really worried about that coming in. He didn't do that. He was awesome. He was super calm and not panicked. He's a big dude too. He's isn't tall he? and he's got, you know, me, I, I also say that in MLS, everyone in MLS is going to make mistakes. That's the level. This is at. there are no mistake free players here. And if you have recovery pace, Ima has it too, but Giovanni showed that he has it. That's great. He got to the end. He got balls in. I, I asked coach if he's a guy that was like, believe that like, if you get a card and get suspended, like, can you lose your job or do you get it back? And he said, specifically, he said that every game and every position is competition. Yeah. Implication being that, yeah, if the other guy comes in and plays great, that that guy can keep a spot. Now, he also said that Ema's been playing really well, too. So, But I totally agree with you that like I saw plenty from Giovanni in this game that makes me think, you're playing again. You know, Not that, not that Ema has been, in my opinion, bad, but sometimes another guy just looks really good, and so you run with that guy. Well, he's a little bit of a change-up for Ema. He seems to make a little bit more offensive decisions. You know, he gets forward a little bit yeah. deeper and, and more often. And I and, and at least the way that he crosses the ball is different. Um, I'm not necessarily sure he's any more accurate than Emma has been. I just feel like his stuff is a little more dangerous. He's more direct to the end and cross. Uh, Tuomasi wants to slash a little more. You know, and whether it's because Tuomasi played like a four three three slashing wing in college, and sometimes has to for Dallas and training and stuff, you know, and Giovanni is more of a Brazilian style run the line kind of guy, so there's a different vibe there. But um, you know, both those guys can play, and I thought Giovanni was in this game was the thing I was so terrified he was going to do. He didn't do, and like everything about his game was like, you know what, 
that looked great. So you can go again as far as I'm concerned, you know. Uh, and the Farfan went off with a hamstring injury, did he not? Did I? Am I making that up? Oh, I missed that if he did. Well, oh. he came um. off, and I thought he came off due to injury. I just felt like that was a late, you know, fresh legs kind of move, but maybe oh, I just missed okay. it and wasn't paying attention. I mean, I, I, thought, I know Juka came in for him, but that was... Oh, I thought he went out. Seemed fine in the locker room. After. Okay. All right. Maybe uh, again. Maybe no, I, I mean, it. you know, it's very possible that a guy might be like quietly reaching for his hamstring and I totally missed it. I mean, I, you know, it's, I'm well, I was watching it on drink, TV you know? and for some reason in my head, I thought I heard somebody say he grabbed his hamstring or, yeah. or something like that. So he I may don't. have commentators sometimes notice that when I don't sit yeah. next to Joe Yahoo in the stands. <laughs> don't call your wife Joe Yahoo. That's rude. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, how, we got another we got another episode of the uh of the adventure series of ibby and tafari yeah how are we feeling about this episode are, we, are they coming along nicely or are you further concerned yeah. in need for a center back well let me just say that well no no we still need a center back but let me just say that i was completely wrong and what well, i suggested that i thought jose martinez might come in anticipating that portland would be in the slow block low to mid block and they wouldn't have any of the ball. And I was like, okay, so bring in Martinez. He can pass the ball around a little bit better than he can. Well, if Martinez would have started, Dallas would have lost that game like 4 nothing, Because Ibiya, they Portland resorted to like long ball city, and they had some dudes that can run. And Ibiaga was able to run with them. If it had been Martinez, they'd have been in trouble. And so I was totally wrong in that prediction. So I'm actually leaning, and I want to hear where Dan is on this. I'm leaning towards Ibiaga and Tafari to be the way to go, generally speaking, over the rest of the season. I think there will be times where Martinez will be the better choice. This would not have been one, and I will see about this weekend. But I'm leaning towards Ibiaga because, again, everyone makes mistakes in this league. Can you have the recovery pace to make it, to shut it down and get it cleaned up? I, I totally agree. I'd be down for that uh, pairing. Um, out of interest, would you go uh, to far right, left, or right? I, I think I would go to far right, left, uh, just because he's been doing it more in that way. And, to, and Ibiaga on the right is simpler for Ibiaga. In a sense, he doesn't have to think about it as much. It's more natural. It's more instinctive. That'd be the only reason why I would do it that way. But in the long run, the real answer is you need a left center back and it would be too far right, new guy left, but that's left center backs are expensive, man. You know. Uh, okay, so coming up this weekend, the they do. Can I say one more thing about Portland first? Oh, of course, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I remind. I was reminded how much I I just absolutely love Eric Williamson. I don't often talk about other teams, but that dude makes my soccer hairs on the back of my neck stand up as a player. Uh, maybe it's just me. Like every time he what got about the ball, what, what about it? He just has like a power uh, on the ball. When he has the ball at his feet, it's, it like it glues in and he has this strength. Like guys smash into him and he just boom, takes it and moves. You know, I don't know that he was necessarily great in this game. Just the, But the way he plays, just like I would be like, if that dude was available, I would get him so fast. He just plays the way I like guys to play. You know, because sometimes just... I get a joy out of watching certain guys play compared to other guys, right? There are always guys that make me excited. Like, you know how I felt about over time, there's been <laughs> guys that have made me really excited about, as players is what we're talking about. And it's, it's, this guy's like that. It's like, you know, he's like Kyle Backerman for me, that same vibe. That's interesting. Like, oh man, I want him on my team so badly. I, I, you know, I've heard a lot of praise about him over the years. And for some reason, uh, he's never stood out to me uh, in any extended periods of time. I mean, I've obviously seen him do nice little things here and there, but I've never picked up on why people like you seem to love him so much, which is a shortcoming on my part. I'm not saying anybody's wrong or whatever. I just have never noticed it. So it's, I'm interested that you you uh, you seem to yeah, admire I him too. It's hard to say exactly what it is. It's just sometimes there are guys that something about what they do, the way they do it, the way they carry themselves, their, oh, I their get physical it. Yeah. attributes. It just like speaks to me as a player. Like that's my kind of player. And like, I feel that way about him. Like the minute the ball came to his feet, I was like, Oh, he's right. That guy, guy, he's good. You know, I think right now he's in a system where there's not a lot going on and he's having, he's being forced to play this discipline mid block. He probably doesn't love that. <laughs> he's probably doesn't love that it's just kind of a boot and run kind of thing. But, you know, if you put him in a different team, I think like if you took 
this is true of probably a lot of players, but if you took him and stuck him in LA's lineup instead of Acosta, like he would just be amazing to me. It was interesting to see uh, those moments where, uh, you know, Portland just lacked anything in the midfield that he was the one stepping up. Uh, you know, th- those were typically the times where he was putting in a really hard challenge on Paxton. Uh, picked up a few fouls, but in places he needed to be. It was, you know, a good. It was a good team performance from an individual. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, he's a universally admired player in this yeah. league, and so uh, uh, I. I yeah, I'm I'm the idiot. Yeah, I, uh, I, I watched him th- the whole game thinking, God dang, we got to get him back in the national team. It was like I kept thinking that the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Saturday night, uh, 6.30 local time, the guys have to travel out to Fort Lauderdale to face off against Miami, who are now losers after winning their first two games, have now lost four in a row, uh, which is interesting because they lost uh, uh, away at NYCFC. They lost away at Toronto. Uh, they lost a home to the fire and then lost last weekend away to Cincinnati. And it, this does feel like, well, <laughs> you know how this league goes, Buzz. Uh, you, this is one of those games where you're on the road uh, and you're yeah. facing a team that's on a pretty extended losing streak. This isn't one that you can just look past because th- these are the kind no, of no, games no. where teams turn things around and slump busters, as we would call them. Yeah, uh, I I would feel like... Um, that Miami is a, and I could be wrong. I, I feel like Miami is a European old guy vibe and philosophy, and they don't. And I don't think from the clips I've watched, Dan is not offended by that phrase yeah. in any way, shape, or form. Oh, I don't resemble that remark. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't feel like they're like they're not like um, Minnesota. That's like going to be a direct track meet. Or they're not like Nashville. What's going to come in and smash you? I just feel like. They're going to be a team that's going to try and be savvy and keep the ball when they can and move it around in the midfield a little bit, right? So I also think this is a game where you're likely to see Dallas attempt a uh, tactical shift. Um, you know, what Jimenez is getting really, really close to being able to start and maybe even can start. They're really looking to try and push his minutes up. So I don't think they'll be looking for like 20 minutes from him. They'll want to maybe get 45 or even like start him and let him go to like 50 or 60 probably. So I know today in training they worked on two different formations, neither of which were the usual 4-3-3. And I know that yesterday they worked on a, another formation that, that, uh, that I didn't see today. That And Coach has said that they want to try and mix it up. And we've talked about how effective Jimenez it was or is. We, you know, So there are some possibilities there. And I think that this team, because it's not going to be a team, they might defend in a low block, but I don't think they're going to be a boot it and run at you team in counter. I think once they get it, I think they'll want to play back at you. So that'll, I think, provide a little bit of chance for Dallas to do their midfield press and turn you over thing that they like so much. I think they'll have to do a little bit of block breakdown, but not as much. So, um you know, we can we can talk a, a bit about the, what our guesses is the shape might be, but I think honestly, you might have to just sort of wait and see what happens on this one because I know there's at least three different tactical shapes in consideration, which you might find kind of weird. But this coach likes to make decisions late in the week and keep everybody. Coach Nico Steves is big on the mental side of the game. He likes to mix up all the groups and mix up the tactics all week long in training because he wants you to stay engaged his whole squad to stay engaged that they might be in. So I better damn well know what I'm doing and have all these things on lockdown. So, okay. Um, I, I want to, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You say that he is all about the mental, but yeah. I feel like th- the Portland game is yet another example of this team coming out really flat. Yeah. And, and we talked about this last week or the week before. I know we've talked about it many times. This, you know, not coming out in a spirited manner and ready to go is, I think, now officially a label we can put on a Nico Estevez Dallas team. Yeah, it may be that it's too, that he's doing too much. It may, I know for a fact that, like, the scouting reports that, the, that he and his staff give to the team are way deeper and more complicated than scouting reports from previous regimes. All, like, all of them, not just the one right before this. Mm-hmm. So it may be partially mental overload. It may be 
you know, and obviously he would like to push his team to be better in that direction. He really wants to have a team this year that can switch in and out of formations at will and play different formations. And so you may be looking at this season as some of the pains that we're seeing may be symptomatic of this idea, you know, that he's trying to make this team be something that they're not yet. You know, that's part of growing as a team, right? Now, I will say, too, that, like, we love to sort of throw around this idea that Dallas is a young team. Well, the end of the last game against Portland, it wasn't so young at the end. Like, a lot of the old guys had come in, and they didn't hold up. So there, it's it's not necessarily fair to say this team is young because sometimes it's not young. Sometimes it can be really old when it, when they gets all the old guys in there. I just think that you're probably looking at a situation where they're going to want to um, keep the other team a little off base and try to take advantage of some of the things that looked really good. Like we, we all really liked Jesus under Jimenez, right? Mm-hmm. So which shape could that happen in? Are we ready to start Jimenez? He might be making that decision like on Friday, you know, like, do I think he's ready or not to Jimenez to start? Oh, if he's not, is there somebody else I can put in a two striker system? Like I watched Legette play as a forward today in training some, Right. So, you know, there are possibilities that at play here. And I really think coach might be making up his mind late in the week on this one. Well, I'm glad to hear that he's he's looking at alternatives because what they've been doing isn't working very yeah, well right, yet right. this season. You know, um, all right. So that game is at 630 Dallas time on Saturday yeah. night in Miami. By the way, it's also one of the free games on Apple TV. It's not you don't have to have uh, MLS season pass to watch it. So Let me go know. just so far as to say, I think because of the way I think Miami plays again, this might be a game. Martinez will come in. I think because of the way they play, I could be wrong, but that's possible. Even though I'd rather go with Ibiaga most of the time. I think Giovanni will get the call because he was really good. Um, the Facundo Edwin thing is interesting. If you're going to go back from suspension, how long yeah. was this? Was it just, just one a one game? game? Yeah, okay. he could go. But the Facundo um, Evan Surreal thing is interesting because I think Evan's been playing great. But if you're going to play a pure 4 2 3 1, which is what you have to do to give Jesus that freedom, or even a 4 4 2 flat, not, it's not flat, it's a modern one. But, you know, the Paxton Facundo combo might be better, it's more stable, more of like a guy locked in right there in the middle because Facundo plays more of that pure metronome sort of back and forth right in front of the center backs kind of thing. And if you do have Martinez back there, maybe that's the better choice in front of that combo, maybe. I'm running through lots of options here because, honestly, in training, this today was the more chaotic and different than I've ever seen in terms of them exploring ideas. So I don't think he's decided. Okay. What else about training that you uh, saw? Anything, or any, or should I put it this way, anything else about training you noticed today that you wanted to bring up on the pod? Uh, the spirit was really good. Um Mulatto was gone. I forgot to ask where he was. I think I assume he's with North Texas. Um, Hope uh, Kodzu, who's the you know, Hope of Veyu from the North Texas, was up. That was cool seeing that kid up there playing. That was nice. He's a good player. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't play around though when those guys come up. They treat them just like anybody else, and they'll smash them just like they will anybody. They don't get no, no kid gloves. Um, Eye Stone's gone, so there was a different academy kid up working today. I think actually it was one of the North Texas guys, I think, now that I think about it. But nothing really tremendously stood out other than it was a long session. And as again, as I say, lots and lots of chaos. And it was cold. <laughs> Two days ago, it was 92 at Dallas Cup, and today it was 52 and windy at the start of training. <laughs> It's awful. Buzz has to put up with the terrible spring weather. Uh, <laughs> I, real quick, on the Miami thing, sorry, real yeah. quick, quick kit question. How do you think this will get assigned as a kit assignment? Will Miami wear pink and Dallas then wear the burn white jersey? Because then it's too light colored jersey. No, I I think if Miami wears pink, then Dallas will wear red. If if that if Miami wears black, what's Miami's home jersey this year? I think it's the the, pink. I thought it was pink. Is it not Dan? Dan's looking it up. No, Buzz is looking it up. Oh, oh. Yeah, I'm looking for the jersey jerseys. Uh, You're listening to live coverage yeah. of Buzz Carrick searching the internet. 
Well, unfortunately, they don't call them, you know, secondary or primary. They just call them black and pink. So, that well, matter. if it's black, then obviously Dallas would wear white. And yeah. then, but if it's their pink, it's that's such a weird mix with red. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Well, how we this saw gets... Portland wear that rose against the red. It's it's you know it's various. Oh, that's enough. true. Yeah. God, those are awful jerseys. They are. I was, that is a jersey that I thought I liked when I first saw it, and then I saw it in person. And went, oh no, that's yeah, not it's no, good. It's no good in person. It's not good. Okay, I would, I would just I'm assume sorry. it based it on the on whatever Miami thinks is their home kit, you know. So, hmm. okay. Uh, all right, uh, Dan. Anything else about uh, the senior team that you would like to speak to before I move on to Dallas Cup conversation? Mm, no, sir. Oh, sir. Okay. Dallas Cup. We are in the midst of Dallas Cup. Buzz, you have done amazing uh, God's work, oh, the Lord's work this week so far. Um, I, I, so I think the big thing that everybody got ta- that got everybody talking was the game between the Uni- and the U19 group between was it the super group or the base night the regular 19 group? The Which, Dallas Real Madrid game. That's oh, obviously super group. Super group right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Straw Madrid, duh, Peter. Duh. Um, so that game was being played up at MoneyGram, and it had a beautiful sight. Like the pictures you posted on Twitter just totally made me uh, all fuzzy warm because it's mm. the great scene of Dallas Cup when people surround the field in like groups of three and four deep. It's such a great look. Um, and there was actually too many yeah. people because they were. Uh, it turns out that uh, some of the rules that Dallas Cup has in terms of people being on the side where the benches are had gotten a little overcrowded. I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but that game apparently I didn't see it, but I, I I know many people that were there, including you, and I heard it was quite an electric scene and quite a good game. Yeah, it was the biggest crowd I've seen at a Dallas Cup game, not stadium. It was unbelievable. Like the. You know, you know that back door is out the back of that MoneyGram, right? That yeah. dirt road was lined both sides all the way down past the train of people yeah. parking. It was, I've it. never seen so many people there in my life. Uh, phenomenal game. Now, <laughs> here's the problem. Uh, I'm not talking – I have to talk about this ref. I'm not usually a guy to care about the refs, but clearly there's an issue with this ref. Like, I took one look at him, uh, and I'm not – into body shaming, but I took one look at the guy and I thought to myself, I'm a fat bastard. Don't get me wrong. I I took one look at this guy and I thought this is not going to work. And within a minute or two of the game, the dude is jogging at best. And I wouldn't even call it a jog. It really is a walk. There's no running involved. He breathed like Carlos Valderrama played like 10 yards past the center circle. And that's it. Was it an old guy? Oldish, yeah, okay. FIFA badge, man. You got to pass the fitness requirements or whatever. But there's yeah. no way this ref is up for the physical requirements of this U19 supergroup. This is professional players in this game, both sides. You know, so it's like this guy should not have been refing this game based on what I'm witnessing. Now I know that they look at all their resumes. I'm, I'm, I understand this guy is qualified for this game, but not what I'm looking at. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So. He's basically walking around and he's calling stuff from the 40 yard line. And five minutes into the game, and I'm going to tell the Nolan Norris story part now, which is the only part I really want to talk about, other than a little bit here on the ref on the back side of this. Nolan, five minutes into the game, Nolan's going up for a header in the box, and there's sort of contact with the keeper. And the keeper, as they do, he catches the balls and he flops down on the ground like keepers do. And once he's on the ground, the keeper goes, oh, and starts rolling around like keepers do, right? No big deal. Nobody in the game thinks it's a big deal. Both teams are jogging towards midfield. The minute the ref hears that noise, he obviously thinks there's a problem, and he walks all the way down to the keeper, and then he asks the three defenders that are still standing there who hit the keeper. He didn't see it. And so they say Nolan. And so he, he calls to Nolan, and Nolan is now at midfield. And Nolan says, hey, my bad. He holds up his hand and said, I got you, my bad. And the ref says, no, come down here. And he makes him come all the way back down to the box to warn him. And from then on, he had his eyes on Nolan. So he didn't give him a yellow at that point? Not at that point. Okay. And then, so later on, Nolan makes a foul that's worth a yellow, although I didn't think it was that bad, but Nolan's like, fine, I got a yellow. And then about five minutes for the end of the half, there's some contact in the box. And now I, at this point, am like 80 yards away. So I cannot tell you whether it's a PK or not. 
people I know that were standing this there didn't think it was a PK. Nolan doesn't think it's a PK. The guy gives a PK. Now, again, he's calling this from about the 40-yard line as he's walking behind the play. And he walks all the way down to where Nolan is now standing there raising his hands like, what is going on? And he gives Nolan a second yellow card. Nolan waits like 30 seconds of like, I can't believe this. And so he starts walking off the field and uncharacteristically for Nolan, he says something to the ref. The ref whips out his yellow card and gives Nolan a third yellow card and then a red card. So he clearly has lost track of the whole game and lost track of the cards. And for the predominantly the whole game and from the very beginning, from the minute, like there was his first initial foul, any kind of contact at all, any player on the ground was a foul on Madrid. I'm a big time. You just have to play with the ref you're given. But to me, it all feels way, way out of whack. Like there's a preconceived narrative in this, in this ref's mind. And the only reason I say that is because they got to halftime after they were down a man. Now Dallas is, and the refs walk off and they come back out with the second half and the center ref is gone. They've pulled the center ref. And so later on after the game, I ask around and I turn and I'm told that he's pulled for health reasons. I don't have a whole lot of information beyond that. People that I talked to that were on the coaching side of the field felt like it was more than just health. It might've been mental, you know, not being ready for the game, but there's, you can think of the combination of the guys, apparently Scottish it's 90 degrees in Texas. He is it's a Scottish. High, massive yeah. profile game. He's not near in shape enough to be running with these players. You know, he's not as bad as me, but it's definitely not, you know, it doesn't look like you either. You know, Peter, he's not skinny by any stretch of imagination. So, to, in my mind, the whole first ha- half, I think he was in a poor mental state in terms of like how he was feeling or something. I've never seen a ref lifted. I've seen a ref lifted for injury. I've never seen him lifted for whatever he got lifted for. Now, all games are assessed in this tournament. You know that. It's a massive assessment tournament. So I'm sure his performance and whatever else that contributed will be looked at. But it was really, really weird. And the, the main come away of the whole thing is that no one will now be able to tell the story of the game. He got three yellow cards in one game, which is mostly funny at this point. But Diego Pepe, by the way, is for real. He scored a goal against Madrid. That's pretty cool. They were actually leading at one point. Then Madrid got a goal, and then they got a guy red carded uh, for a second yellow also. And then they ended up getting a second goal. Dallas's keeper was really good. There were a couple of the players that were good. But, you know, it was a great game other than the fact that the ref was like, what the hell is going on with this ref? So it was a weird one. Yeah, uh, and that's one of those deals where if you ever get an opportunity to go to something like that, you should take the you should take it because they're electric scenes, and it's it's mm. one of those deals where I love watching games in parks like this where there are no stands, everybody just circles and makes like a a human stadium for lack of a better way yeah. of saying it around the field. It's so cool, and it can and it also can be kind of intimidating because the scenes can get a little weird, which leads us to the next story. Yeah. Which which is what happened yesterday at Richland College because the games are spread out all over the city. There's a set of games at Richland College uh, kind of over in Richardson. Uh, And there were two games going on at the same time. And the account that I have been told is that full-on fights and brawls broke out. Two different incidences, but they happened essentially at the same time. And uh, and it was a bad scene, and and there were police on hand, and I'm told that there is an adult in jail at this moment for punching a kid, mm. and uh, and I think one of the Dallas there was an uh, an FC Dallas ECNL team was one of the teams and of the four teams involved, and that's about as much as I know. Yeah, I did not. I don't know any of the details of this these things. One of them happened on the field next to where I was watching, and you know, I so I'm basically like a field and a half away. And I, but I hear the noise, and so I look over, and there's just a mass of humanity out on the field. And so I knew something was going sideways, but I was like, I'm going to stay here and watch FC Dallas play on this. It was the U16s that were playing at the time. I'm, I'm going to stay right here and watch this, but I wonder what's going on over there. And I saw cop lights come in, and there were a bunch of cop cars at the end of the day over there. So 
Yeah. yeah, I think you and I can attest that every year at Dallas Cup, there's at least one notable kerfuffle that happens. It feels like this particular one was uh, a little bit more um, for, uh, violent than normal. Yeah. Um, but it also is a little bit concerning with how things go these days and things happen with people in those big open spaces like that. So uh, it, it is a little bit like you, you see things like this happen and go on for as long as they did. If you there's a video video of the of the of at least one of the fights on Facebook somewhere somebody showed it to me and it goes on like way too long like it's a good yeah. four and a half minutes of fight starting fight kind of subsiding and then picking back up again and it's uh it was pretty bonkers yeah I'm not in the world of you soccer but from where I stand the worst part about you soccer are the parents and you since I was a kid, we would have fights in games among yeah. players. We're teenage boys, right? They get in fights. It happens, right? It's when you get these bench clearing parents running on the field that you have a problem. That's when the thing escalates to an out of control state, you know, and I have no idea about who was at fault or who did any running on the field, but I know that the difference now to when you and I were kids is the parents. That's what's different Boys are boys, girls are girls. We're the same teenagers as we always were. We we talk the same trash. We, I've been punched in the face in a soccer game, just as you have, I'm sure. Uh, knowing you maybe more than me, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like this yeah. stuff went on, and it still goes on. And if you can't control your parents, that's the issue. And that like when we were kids, we didn't have these create. But, you know, we probably did. Did We must have had crazy parents. But I don't think we had them like we had them now, man. No, we're Gen X. Parents just let us yeah. like, leave the house and <laughs> <laughs> I didn't guess. worry about us. Yes. We didn't have these helicopter parents like we have now. Or these, you know, and I will admit that, like, when the higher you go up these ranks, man, you get these parents that are just absolutely nuts about these kids sometimes. Oh. And I know of multiple cases where parents have absolutely negatively impacted a kid's potential career or even ended a kid's potential career because no one wants to deal with how insane their parents are. You know, it well, happens. No, I, parents are the reason why I quit refereeing Classic League yeah. a, dec a decade ago. Because it just, like, just the audacity of parents to come up and, and I, like, if a player wanted to come yell at me after a game for a decision, that, I, you know, I could tolerate that. But at some point when parents started coming up to you and wanting to have a, you know, a, <laughs> write a yeah. stern letter to the URL to your face, I, I no, I just, it's like, it's okay, I don't need that. that. I, don't, I don't need that in my life. Well, let's not undersell, however, this is an amazing tournament. I have never felt unsafe at any event there. It's fantastic. I, agree. I highly recommend any of it. You know, it's it's not any more unsafe than any other classic league or game that you ever go to where there's some crazy parent on the sideline. That's just the nature of the beast of sports these days. But the, the high level competition is is phenomenal. Sometimes you get dud games, but sometimes you get absolutely classic, amazing games at all levels and all groups of the thing. Obviously the super group has a higher percentage of those, but you can still get absolute cracker games, you know, from both the boys and the girls, man, you know, like Peter, you remember that final, that cup final with Jaden Shaw, which he was just oh, yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> That's so good. That game was, you know, that may have been the best game I saw that year in the whole tournament. Cause of her, she was unbelievable. You know, it's just, you can see that all throughout. I, I guarantee you that like, if you go out and watch any of these teams, like Zidane's kid played for Madrid, There'll be some kids that you saw this week in the Dallas Cup that'll be on professional games within a, inside of a year, sometimes even closer. You know, big European teams, even not just domestic ones. Yeah, and I do. I also, and I certainly want everybody to come away from this uh, feeling good about the Dallas Cup in every way, shape, and form because it does feel like for the first time since prior to the pandemic, the quality, the level, the consistency, the excitement, the vibe of what we all have historically known. The Dallas Cup to be is 100% back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first year after the COVID, I was a bit worried, but they rebounded big time with the, the international clubs. And I'm sure next year will get better still. You know, they need to fill up some of the lower non super group brackets a touch bit more. But when you get Arsenal and Madrid to come back and Botafogo and Tigres and Monterrey, they'll all follow down the Eintracht. Frankfurt came back again. So it's all it's great. I know you've largely just been doing Dallas games, so I'm going to ask you first, other than a Dallas player, has anybody, is there a kid that you've seen that you're like, oh my God, that made you feel the way uh, Mr. Williams did for 
Yeah, there's a kid that plays for DKSC's ECNL side. His name is Everett Fisher. Uh, I knew about him before because he's been in the U.S. camp. Um, he's a Tanner Testman clone. Oh, like, wow. literally. Like, I was like, What's what? his name? Everett Fisher. He plays okay. for DKSC, ECNL, which is crazy. But, like, I, I started, I was thinking about, like, I wanted to write a little bit on him. I was thinking about all his attributes, and I was like, shit, it's Tanner. So, it's like, he was fun. He was a good player. Um, it's too bad he's not in ECL instead of is he, the academy. Is he gonna but. get a is he gonna get a, a scholarship to go kick for an SEC team for Clemson? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no, because like Tanner, I think he's better than that. Yeah, yeah. he'll probably end up being a professional if he chooses to go that route. Um, you know, DKSC actually, they I think it was intentional. They played that right back to center back fl- the um, uh, flow that the Bearhalter was trying to do with the national team. Remember that when he was doing out. Yeah. Top- they do that with their one of their right backs. That's really impressive at a 19 level to pull that off. Either that or their right back is just nuts and goes wherever he wants. But I'm pretty sure it was intentional, <laughs> and they were doing that bit. So that was really impressive. Hmm. Any other uh, Dallas players in particular of note that you have gotten to spend more time than normal with? Well, there's a um, there's a couple of kids on the 19s that have come along. Um, Recently, like uh, Mason Grimm has taken a big step forward. He looked pretty good. Um, Dylan Lacey, who's been kind of an 8-10 and struggled to like find the defensive side. Bizarrely, the the new 19 coach, Chewy, has got him playing as a 6, and he looks fantastic, like a deep playmaker, like mm-hmm. a Modric-style deep playmaker. That's pretty cool. I don't know whether that will translate to the MLS game or not, but it sure looks cool at this level. Um, and then there's a kid named Caleb Swan who plays for the 16s, who is like a whole second ahead of the game. I think that kid is so good. And then there was a there was a guy for the U14 team I've never seen before. Um, and I I've I've I hate to say something crazy good about him after basically one game, but and that he's a U14. <laughs> he's a U14. Well, U14, the first game I saw Nolan Norris, uh, remember, I was like, oh my God, this kid's amazing after one game. And so this kid gave me that same kind of vibe. I want to wait a little bit before I hard sell him because I have only seen him the one time. But his name is Kyle Velasquez. Uh, he's a 6'8 kind of player. Um, and he, he not, made he's me not six foot eight. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Well, they have a guy who's six, four on that team. He's in seventh grade. He's a U14. He's six, four. He just Holy joined the cow. Academy. I mean, the, the U14 level is nuts because that's where you get the mismatches of six, four versus like four foot six, right? That happens. It's so weird that age level, but this kid's name Kyle Velasquez. He actually came from solar this season to join FC Dallas. He made me go, he made my eyes open wide. I was like, Oh, now again, one viewing, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tap the brace a little, but you know, it's every once in a while a kid gives me a reaction. Nolan did the same thing. You know, it's pretty exciting when you see a player like that. I'll let you know in the long run whether I still feel that way about him or not. But first man, viewing was super good. Dan, you just know the TikToks tomorrow with uh-huh. this podcast is gonna start going wild. Third degree talked about so and so. Well, the team they were oh. playing was garbage, so it wasn't that telling, but he had a whole lot of skill set that I really, really liked. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Dallas Cup continues. The finals are all at uh, Toyota Stadium this particular weekend. Uh, again, if you get a chance to go take in the cup, do so. It's the best thing about living in Dallas. Other than slurping. That's a little that's a little <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I don't know it's the best thing about living in Dallas. But name something better about the living Dallas in Cowboys Dallas. Are than the, better, Dallas cup. the barbecue. You know, there's lots the of Dallas things. Cup? You the put best. the Cowboys over the Dallas Cup? Oh, yeah, dude. Even after the last 27 years? It doesn't matter. It's the Cowboys. Okay. All right. I mean, FC Dallas is better than the Dallas Cup. But I, I do love the Dallas Cup very, very much. I just don't think it's the best thing about living in Dallas. Okay. You That's know me. I'm, I'm, to me. <laughs> I admit I'm prone to hyper, hyperbole yeah, every once in a while. Yeah, it was hyperbolic. I'll give yes, you that. No, okay. it's really, really good. You should. Everybody should go watch it. I just. I'm, I'm getting be- run on Twitter currently from some guy who's bitching at me for referring to Aston Villa as milk toast. So, because <laughs> I, I said I thought they were milk toast. I think I'm right, but whatever. I don't. I, apparently, I, I pulled a string there. So, all My right. Well, Newcastle will be good today. I'll tell you that. Mm. Yeah, Newcastle good. Uh, you know what was really good? Luton? Luton beating the piss out of Watford. 
That is always good. Oh, man. Damn, damn it. I'm sorry. I meant to start with the podcast that way and let you celebrate a victory over your most hated nemesis. Oh, it was a celebration. That's a good one. It's like it's like the Space Federation getting one over on the Romulans or something. Okay. Sure. Didn't get that. That. <laughs> That's a Star Trek reference, sir. Yeah. You just uh, nerded out hard. That's right. I did. I did that for my nerd the nerd listeners of the pod. Yeah. So what was the score, Dan? Uh, it was two now in the end. Yeah, and what was the best moment? Did, did did some Watford player just start crying or break a leg or something? Uh, the best part was probably well, one of our players, Gabe our show, he missed an easy chance, and he scores right in front of your away fans. He does a little crying eyes to him. He got sent off there <laughs> last season, so it was his nice redemption moment. Did the crying but eyes? <laughs> the uh, the best part was after the game because. I don't know if you know this about Watford, but the only thing that's worthwhile in in Watford is Harry Potter World or whatever it's called. So the buses that they got to bus the fans on were the Harry Potter tour buses with all the all the branding on the side of it. Uh, so there was a lot of piss taking about taking buses back to Hogwarts, mostly from Watford fans at themselves. Uh, and just being absolutely dejected that uh, little old Luton um, deserved to beat them. It was great. And where are you in the table now? Uh, we are fourth, I think. Okay. And where's Watford? Where's Stinky Watford? I think they're 12th now. Uh, no, they're 11th. We're 12 points ahead. All right. Good for you. So in a, in, a, in a game where Luton's kit is orange and Watford is typically yellow, what what is uh, what did Watford wear? They played in black and white. Black and white, okay. Yeah, yeah we've had weird kit clashes over the years when we used to play in... I bet. White and black. Uh, there was uh, a time in 2002 where I like, had to wear the white, black, and orange home jersey with the blue... And orange shorts and socks. It was, mm. uh, yeah, fun. Speaking of shirts, I uh, purchased my Dallas Tornado shirt, mm. uh, Buzz. It's Ooh. waiting for me. I have to go pick it up because I'm do. too cheap to spend the $8. Uh, that moment shipping. was brought to you by Soccer 90. <laughs> Although I realize I'll probably spend $8 in gas there and back. Um, so maybe I'll need to go stop at Ikea on the well, way. Well, I grab it when you're there for the Dallas Cup finals this next week. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very All good. Right. Before we go, we oh, have a we have a Patreon what? request to discuss oh. Alex Zendejas and his time here and like why he left and all that kind of stuff. Do you, do you remember a whole lot about him in his time here? I don't. I mean, I remember he was here, and yeah. I remember mm-hmm. he was kind of a he was kind of a fringe player. Yeah. And uh, my recollection is is that he had an opportunity to go to Mexico, and Dallas had an opportunity to make three quarters of a million dollars, and they went yeah. deal. <laughs> well, he 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 was thirteenth player out of the academy, and over the first two seasons, he played eight times uh, for Oscar. By the way, this is under Oscar. Like, I don't ever remember him playing for the senior team. Yeah, played eight games for FC Dallas. Wow, you know, I would have I would have said maybe one. Well, that's friends, just like Thomas Roberts. You know, who played six games or something. So. Um, but over two seasons, you know, essentially the same sort of thing. It's like he's not yet in the first team. This is before Dallas has sold big time players for big time money. I think um, this may have been the first player or the, or the second player. Like um, the keeper Sanchez Richard may have been Sanchez was first, first probably. So I think you know five hundred thousand to Dallas at the time sounded like a big deal. You know, he'd been a U.S. you know fifteen and seventeen, and then not really progressed past that. And in, in those terms, you know, he was a really really good player. But he hadn't. He wasn't like look. People weren't looking at him like a world beater. He mm-hmm. um, was on the fringe and and has not breaking in. And so the thought was basically like, okay, well, if there's no reserve team at this time, right? So the idea I think was, okay, we can sell him, make a little bit of money. He can go play for the clubs in Mexico that have reserve teams, which is exactly what happened. He went and played U twenty and he worked his way up, and then he got into the Mexico twenty ones and twenty threes and stuff. The weirdest part about that whole story is that prior to him going to um, Chivas in Mexico, FC Dallas and everybody else always said the kid was from El Paso. You know, he's a U.S. citizen. He's a U.S. eligible player. You know, he was always from El Paso up until they sold him to Chivas, who can't use American players, right, for their own rules. All of a sudden, boom, he's born in Mexico, born in Juarez. So 
where he's really born, I have no idea. I just thought it was hysterical at the time that all that happened. Like the picture we have of him on our website is him holding a Texas flag. You know, <laughs> it's like that's where he considered himself. Yeah. But, you know, he was he was a player that was because there was no reserve team here. He was not developing enough. They didn't really have loan deals kind of set up at that time with these USL clubs like they do now. So there was a small profit on a good player that they knew was going to get a better opportunity in Mexico. And that's proven to be correct. I think you, know? you also have to remember he was playing left wing. You had Fabian Castillo. For as far as you knew, Fabian Castillo was going to be here for a long time. He was just starting to really come into his own. Uh, and, and Zendayas, when he did play, you know, he was undersized. He hadn't really built himself up very much. He was getting pushed off the ball far too easily. It, it, you know, he he needed to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It, I remember back at the time thinking, wow, I'm surprised somebody gave us that much money for him because I hadn't really seen anything out of him. Like I said, I don't even, I, now I don't even recall ever seeing him play for the team. I was more impressed that somebody in Mexico wanted him, was willing to spend all that money on him, so... Yeah, he was a project player uh, and that needed some investment in playing time, and Dallas did not have the way to give it to him. And so yeah. it probably was best for everybody that he went. He, you know, at that time we didn't really have guys that had broken through. Like I think Kellen probably is the first homegrown that really broke through and became a big time player. Yes, I would agree. Recall. Just done it then. Yeah, and so like you know, Zendejas wasn't quite factoring in that way and was a guy that needed more playing time. And again, they didn't have an opportunity to give it to him, and so. You know, I think he was the. I don't think any. He still, I think, likes FC Dallas. I don't ever see him like talking bad about him or anything. You know, he's still obviously coming back to the U.S. national team. He obviously feels good about the United States in terms of his allegiance to it. So, you know, I, I, he's a player that I'd love to have him come back here. I mean, I can foresee a day when they've sold off, you know, Velasco or something, and you need a left wing. He'd be a great guy to bring in, and you know, you could even probably play him on both wings. I'm sure he played right wing for U.S. the other day. So, you know. Uh, a, yeah. a good player and a good product from this academy just didn't quite fit. And it was Oscar too. So of all people like Oscar was willing to move him, you know, when it, he's the kind of player that would fit Oscar's system, you would think. There was definitely never any, uh, any, uh, any visible notion of, uh, you know, feeling hard done by, I mean, he went to, you know, he went to the second division in Mexico. It wasn't like, uh, you know, he was a fringe player in a, a league M team. He, he, you know, he was at that time comfortably below the standard. He yeah. he did the work. He got the the minutes. He, you know, it, it took him a long time to get where, and a lot of graft to get where he is now. Yeah, he hmm. played two seasons for Zaka Tepic. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. In Division Two, as you say, before he went back to Chivas and then the Cox in America, he's done the work and he's earned everything he's getting. You know, and even really at great. Chivas, didn't he go into the reserve team for quite a while? Yeah, he, he started with their U twenty team, I think, and then they loaned him out. And then he, when he came back to Chivas for, you know, another season and a half, it was reserves and then first team. He he did all the things you're supposed to do to work your way in. But he didn't, he only ever played eight games for Chivas's first team. It's like he he really broke through at Nacoxa, you know, between when he went there so, in 2020. I mean, if he doesn't take that journey, who knows what his development really looks yeah. like? Yeah, might have, nothing might have happened. He might be playing at uh, Loudoun United with them. Um... <laughs> Sorry. What? Somebody. Poor guy. That's where um, the kid last year went, Loudoun United. Uh, what kid? Brain farting. The winger, the left winger from Philly. Oh, oh uh, Khalil. Uh, Khalil. Yeah, Khalil on my court. God, yeah. thank okay. Sorry, Khalil. <laughs> Brain farting. Wow. Third Degree of the Podcast has been brought to you by Soccer90.com, the home of the super awesome item of the week, the Dallas Tornado jersey. Get that thing. It is so cool. I got one. Ancestral club to FC Dallas to the burn. You know you love it. Tornado throwback. Third Degree is the code. Soccer90.com, 20% off. Some exclusions apply. But get that jersey. This gun works not it. It's awesome. Get one. Okay, well, it feels like that's a very good time and opportunity yep. to put an end to this particular episode. Dan, thank you very much. It's always good speaking with you, sir. Thank you, and likewise. And Buzz, excellent work as always this week, my friend. Yes, sir, and thank you once again for hurting the cats. Uh, I will always do my best. All right, thank you, uh, FC Dallas Curious Fan. We will speak to you next week on another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Dallas Cup. Third degree, the third
the Green Man Podcast. Third degree, the third degree Man Podcast. Third degree, the third degree Man Podcast. Third degree, the third degree Man Podcast.